Today, I'm going to be talking about how I've set up clipboard sharing to my remote development environment. And to give us some context starting off, I wanna talk about that development environment. So for years, I've just been using Linux installed on a PC or a laptop, and I would do all of my tooling there, coding there, still works great, love that model. But about six plus months ago, I decided to move purely to a virtual machine where I built my development environment using tools like Nix OS and the Nix Package Manager and created an environment from scratch. And the benefits here are that I can rebuild it, I can make portable images that can go into cloud providers or be run locally. It all works really, really well for me. And then the great thing too is that my client machine doesn't actually have to be you know, a beefy machine, let alone does it have to be a specific operating system. I mean, heck, I could even use Linux, uh, Windows as long as I can do an SSH connection into my dev environment, I'll have access to everything I need. Additionally, the VM doesn't even have to run a desktop environment because the tools I'm primarily using to get my work done are things like Tmux and NeoVim, and those work amazing through SSH. In fact, even if I did want to use a more graphical application, like let's say that I wanted to use VS Code, I'll just say VSC for here, it has plugins just like IntelliJ does that can go through SSH connections and plug into some kind of backend VM presenting my files as if they were local, but largely when I'm saving, it's just persisting onto this, this virtual machine. And all in all, I just think this is an awesome model because I'm someone who works in Linux a lot. I don't really wanna care much about what my client machine is to be super honest with you. And while there are tools like Docker Desktop and stuff that try to help give you some of the Linux primitives, those are running VMs under the hood too. In fact, Docker Desktop is largely abstracting QMU for you, setting up that virtual machine, giving you container access. So this builds everything out for me and again, decouples my client machine. And you know, maybe the last thing I'll say on it is I don't do this a lot, but it's kind of cool knowing that I can do it. Let's say that I'm actually running this in AWS on a given day, so my remote development environment. I have the ability to modify that virtual machine's CPU and memory at any given time. So if I wake up one morning and I'm gonna be compiling Firefox from scratch and it's a big task and I want a lot of cores, well, I can just for a couple hours and I need that work, spin up a larger CPU, granted I will pay for it, and I have a much more powerful development environment without actually having to change out my client. There's hopefully gonna be far less need for an upgrade of a laptop or anything like that. Now. This model, hopefully I've kind of sold you on why it works at least well for me, not saying that you should necessarily do it. But one of the interesting things that I constantly ran into was sharing the clipboard. And the clipboard turned out to be quite challenging to share initially, and here's why. So if you've ever used a tool like Fusion or like Parallels, you might know that clipboard sharing is there. But I don't wanna use clipboard sharing through one of these apps, primarily because it's not portable. If I'm running locally on Fusion one day, and then I'm running in AWS the next day, I don't want the clipboard mechanism to be different. Another issue is that my VM isn't running a desktop environment. I don't need GNOME, I don't need i3, everything's going through Tmux and NeoVim or a remote session through a code editor, no need for that. And because there's not a desktop environment, there's actually not a concept of a clipboard for the most part. So what I really needed to do here is find a way to create like a channel or a buffer or a first in first out queue that I could send data to that I wanted to copy and have my Mac slurp that up as it gets put in that buffer. Now, if that sounds at all familiar to something I've talked about recently, that's because the solution was using named pipes. And named pipes, I just released a blog post and video on this a couple days ago. You can check them out if you've never used them. But using named pipes, I was able to just reuse this simple Linux primitive to do exactly what I was hoping to do. So with all of that context in place, let me take you into my development environment and show you how this is all set up. Starting out, I am just inside of my client machine. And you'll notice that there is a Tmux session happening. This is all completely local. I've got the markdown file for the page I was just showing you and so on. This is not using that remote development environment at all. Currently, I have my remote development environment running in my home lab. So I'm gonna SSH into a local IP address. And then the first thing I do once I'm inside of that development environment is I run Tmux. 
Now, running tmux does a couple things for me. The first thing that running tmux does is it sets up another tmux session. So I actually have two tmux sessions mapped to different leader keys. So control L is going to let me do things inside of this server-based environment. And then the normal leader key control B is going to let me jump around inside of the develop or the client machine in this case. And that background change where it's like gray to dark black, I don't know if you can see this inside of the, the video, but that also gives me some contextual awareness of, of where I am. Now to set up the clipboard, the first thing I need to do to make this possible is make sure the named pipe exists. So on my machine, I put this at my home directory in a file called clip. The way that I created this named pipe or first in first out queue is that I did a make FIFO command. So make FIFO and I did that for clip. With clip in place, now I have a first in first out queue. I can have applications forward information to it, and eventually I can have my client machine receive information from it as well. So let's say how we do this in Tmux. If you're not super familiar with Tmux, I'm sure many of you are, a lot of times with Tmux, we run a command where we scroll up inside of Tmux and we wanna select a bunch of text, maybe it's logs and whatnot, and then we will copy this kind of selected buffer into our system's clipboard, but I don't have a system clipboard in this case of tmux. So I'm gonna open up the default config file for tmux, which is home directory tmux.conf, and we're going to go down to the clip option, and I'll talk about these two options that I use. So in the first option, what we're doing, and in my case, I'm using Vim keys and tmux, you can kind of look up how to do this if you're interested. So when I'm doing copy mode VI for the Y key, I want to run this command. I want to run tmux show buffer, and in that show buffer command, it is going to forward it to clip or the named pipe, just like that. That's all it is. If you were using like an X window based Linux machine, you'd likely have a forward command where you were sending it to something like xclip, but this is effectively the equivalent. And then another thing I do in tmux is I do enable mouse interaction. So when the mouse drag happens and this event triggers the mouse drag end pane one, I actually do a copy selection as well. All of these you know, snippets will be in my blog, but when I do that copy event, I want to run the exact same command. So whatever selected, take that buffer, forward it to the named pipe. So as long as my client machine is accepting it, we're all good. Now, you've got kind of some context around tmux now. I'm gonna talk about Vim before I pair them together. So let's go to a file. We'll go into, let's see, just a development project I'm working on right now. And let's open up a file inside of it. All right, so here is a Go file. This has, this is all inside of the machine. So obviously I have all of the auto completion and everything that you'd expect in a development environment. Now, oftentimes in Vim, we select something and we want to paste it. But Vim has kind of two modes, right? It has yanking. It also, maybe even three, it has putting something in a register and then it has just arbitrary commands we run. So if you're familiar with Vim's yank, I actually don't want to change the default behavior of yank. I wanna keep it as is. And I even don't want to mess with like the registers, like the plus sign register that oftentimes gets assigned to a clipboard. I don't wanna play with that whatsoever. What I do wanna do is set up a custom command for Vim where effectively when I use my leader key, which on my machine is assigned to the semicolon, and then with the leader key, I use, uh, let's say C as the character, I think that's what I've got it mapped to. I want it to do this same action. So basically when these get clicked together, let's put some space in here to make it easier to read. When these get clicked together, I want to run the current buffer, right? Or current, let's call it current selection because it's gonna respect visual mode and visual block. And I wanna send that current selection over to my clip file. So very similar to tmux, just some different nuances around how Vim will handle this. All right, so let's see if we can do exactly that. So I will maybe open up a new tab here and let's go to, we'll escape out of this. We're gonna go into my vimrc, which I am using NeoVim, so this will be into config. It will be inside of nvim and it'll be in the init file here. Okay, so now we're inside of my init file and I'm gonna take you to where I've got the clip specified. Now, there are like three ways that NeoVim can be set up or Vim can be set up. Maybe you're just using Vim and you have a VimRC. I'll put a snippet for how that might look in my blog. Perhaps you're using NeoVim and now you have the option of using Lua. 
or vimrc. I am doing it in Lua inside of a uh, init vim file because I'm still a bit in legacy mode. I haven't converted everything to Lua. But the function definition is pretty simple overall, right? So basically what we've got here is I've got a function called save selection to clipboard. I set up this somewhat verbose command, which I won't go into all the details, but it's basically going to take my current selection and then save it out to this clip file. Then I use the Vim API key map setting, and this is going to allow me to specify that when I'm in visual mode and I hit leader C, I am going to run that save selection clipboard command that I just described to you. So that's sort of our function definition, if you will, and how we call it from an API's perspective. All right. So now, assuming you believe me, we've got this set up in Tmux and NeoVim. We'll now look at attaching the client to this named pipe or FIFO queue and see how data can be pushed back and forth. Now let's hook up the client machine to the remote development environment. I've specified in Tmux the dev tab, which is the VM, and client, which is the local machine. Now, as described in that diagram, the actual connection is just done through another SSH connection. So it's not the most elegant solution, but it works super reliably for me. If we can just establish an SSH connection, run a command like cat or something else, it'll actually just sit on that FIFO queue and wait to be able to read something off of it. And as you'll see in a moment, we can eventually wrap this in a loop so that every time we maybe lose connection or pull something off, we just reconnect and, and do it again. And again, there are flaws to this. Like you have maybe another client somewhere that's connected and you know all kinds of kind of chaos, but I never really hit that. This works super well and is super simple for me. So let's attach. I'm running the SSH command and now I'm kind of stuck wanting to cat out the content contents of that named pipe. But there is, of course, nothing inside of that named pipe. So now we'll go back to the development environment and let's do something like a, let's see, let's cat something from it and let's cat the contents of CPU info. So we'll scroll up inside of Tmux and let's say I want to copy to a web browser or something uh, some content about it. And there's obviously a lot of output here because every single processor is listed. So let's just go up and up and up. All right, CPU info at the very top. So on this environment, I will go ahead and use my click and drag to just copy something from here. And when I let go, it will trigger that mouse event and should effectively copy to clip. If I go back to my client, you can now see that my client has pasted out all of that stuff that I just copied. So it's instantly in the clipboard of my client machine. Now I'll go back to the development environment and let's try Vim again, which I think one of these, yes, this one here, I have PEX. So we will do this and let's say that I'm copying some code to send to someone on Slack this time. So I'll go into a file that I know has a bunch of code in it and we'll grab this full function. So I will go through and grab it. And what I'm going to do here again is I'm going to run my leader key with C. And now Vim actually is kind of frozen up and hanging with this little indicator in the bottom left that it is sitting on clip. Now, the reason is because the client is no longer connected, right? It already did that output from Tmux, so it left the SSH connection, finished its job. And we'll talk about how, again, we loop to make that not happen in the future. But for now, if I just reconnect with cat clip, there is the function definition that I just copied out of my development environment using that command. And now back in the development environment, my cursor's free and I'm able to do whatever I want. All right, so kind of the last thing is talking about how to make this work as kind of a constantly running thing. The right way to do it is to use an init system like systemd, or on a Mac system, you can use launchd. Homebrew has some abstractions you can use to set it up where you're actually constantly running this. I'm not gonna go through all the different modes that you can set this up because init systems are your choice. So I'm just gonna do a really naive implementation where we basically do a bash script, which could work, where we say while true, and then we just run do and we will copy this SSH command and paste it in. And then we will say done. And now we are constantly doing this command. We're gonna sit and wait. And then as we do different actions, stuff will print out. So let's go back to Vim and we'll copy just a couple lines. So first we'll copy this length line. So copy that. And then we'll go down and copy what's something that would be more distinct. Let's do this function definition. So we'll copy this, 
run that same command, and then I'll go back to the client, and you can see that first it grabbed the length ops, then it grabbed the Linux inspector, and it's just gonna continue to print and print and print and print. So as the very last step of all of this, if we just exit out of that loop, I will mention that what we want to do is instead of catting clip, which actually will work, we actually wanna just put it into our system clipboard. So let's do just the SSH command one more time. And out of the SSH command, we will put it in this case, I'm on a machine that uses PB copy to command line, get it into the clipboard. And if we just run this command and wait on it again, next time I copy, rather than it printing it out, it's gonna put it inside of my system clipboard. So we'll go back here, we'll copy this definition, we will run the copy command again, go back to the client. You'll notice this time it just exited rather than printing something out. And inside of my client machine, I'm gonna open up a a NeoVim file, again, this is on the client, not the dev machine, and I paste, and there is my function definition. So effectively, they are completely paired together. It's forwarding directly to my clipboard on my guest machine, and again, as far as I'm concerned, this works super, super well. So hope you found this interesting, a little bit random, but kind of a cool topic, and I'll see you in the next one.